Part 2, Refining Assumptions in the Energy Page. In the first part of this video, I did a pre-feasibility analysis of an 80 megawatt wind farm in Newfoundland. I used the Virtual Energy Analyzer to rapidly generate reasonable default values for the project inputs. Now I want to revisit those inputs, particularly in the Energy Page. On the Energy Page, I previously used a Level 1 analysis and assumed a capacity factor of 40%. Was that a good assumption? Let's find out by doing a Level 2 analysis where we will calculate the capacity factor based on inputs for the annual average wind speed. The Red Screen Climate Database provides an estimate of the annual average wind speed of 6.5 meters per second. This was based on measurements 10 meters above the ground at some location near St. Lawrence. As mentioned earlier, this may not be sufficiently accurate for the purposes of estimating the output of this wind farm. There are several reasons for this. First, the output of a wind turbine is related to the cube of the wind speed, so any small error in the speed measurement translates into a much larger percentage error in the electricity production of the wind farm. Second, there could be buildings or other obstacles near the ground station where the measurement was made. These may make it unrepresentative of the unobstructed wind regime. Third, terrain and vegetation or land use affect wind speeds, so even if the measurement at the ground station is unobstructed, the measurement at other locations, even if nearby, can be very different. If the wind farm is not going to be built right at the site of the ground measurement, the wind resource may be very different. Fourth, for large wind turbines, the center of the turbine rotor, or hub height, is likely to be around 100 meters above the ground, not 10 meters. Wind speeds vary with height. While Red Screen can help us estimate the 100 meter wind speed based on the 10 meter wind speed, the greater the difference in height, the greater the adjustment and the greater the potential for introducing error. For these reasons, it is advisable to find accurate estimates of the wind speed at the proposed wind farm location and near the hub height of the turbine. Ideally, we'd have measurements from 60 meter or taller meteorological towers present on the wind farm site for at least a year, and some measurements at higher elevations using a LiDAR instrument. But this is very expensive, and we may not want to wait that long to do a first analysis. The next best thing is a high resolution wind atlas based on models and measurements. There are many different wind atlases. By navigating to the energy page, selecting level 2 for the analysis level, and clicking on the question mark icon beside resource method, you can open a red screen help page with links to various atlases and maps. Alternatively, if I click on the map icon beside the resource method cell, red screen opens a browser window for the global wind atlas. This tool Developed and made freely available by the Technical University of Denmark, the World Bank Group, and other partners, provides information about the wind resource available onshore and nearshore virtually everywhere on the planet. The browser shows a map with redder colors where the wind resource is stronger and bluer colors where it is weaker. I can choose whether the map displays annual average wind power density or the annual average wind speed or other parameters useful for understanding the influence of terrain. The wind speed and power density estimates are available at 50 meters, 100 meters, and 200 meters above the ground. Switching between these heights, the map colors change radically, with much stronger speeds with every doubling in height. The effect of height is particularly evident when looking at the wind power density, or average power available in the wind, per unit of swept rotor area. Let's pick the 100 meter estimate of wind speed. I see, based on the dark red color, that there are a number of locations around St. Lawrence where the estimate is around 9 meters per second. If I select customized areas and select a rectangle, I see that there are locations with average annual wind speeds of 9.15 meters per second. I'll use this in red screen. Before I do that, however, I want to point out that the parameters entered under this Level 2 analysis are completely independent of those used previously in the Level 1 analysis. 
For example, I changed the capacity factor to 40% for the level 1 analysis, but when I switch to level 2, it remains at 41.2%, the value calculated by the virtual energy analyzer. I can switch back and forth between level 1 and level 2, and changes I make in one level will not affect the corresponding cells in the other level. Under level 2, the top part of the energy page is for information about the wind resource. Currently it contains the data from the Retscreen Climate Database. For comparison purposes, these database values are shown in the column to the right of the cells. The Climate Database annual average wind speed is 6.5477 meters per second at a 10 meter measurement height. If I look down the list of parameters, I see that beside the hub height of 100 meters, there is Retscreen's estimate of the 100 meter wind speed. It is 9.04 meters per second. That is pretty close to the global wind atlas value. This time, we were lucky. As we will see in part 4 of this video, the 10 meter measurement is often not accurate. So to demonstrate good practice, I'm going to enter 9.15 meters per second at a measurement height of 100 meters, based on what I found in the global wind atlas. If the hub height of the turbine is not exactly the same as the height of the wind speed measurement, Retscreen uses a power law to adjust the wind speed to the hub height. This power law requires a single parameter, the wind shear exponent, to reflect how the roughness of the surface slows down the wind. We can read more about this in Retscreen's help screen that opens when we click on the text wind shear exponent. It says that a value of 0.14 is a good first approximation when the site characteristics are yet to be determined. That is the value that has been entered by default. We will leave it as is. Annual average values for the air temperature and the atmospheric pressure from the climate database appear in the final two cells of the resource assessment section of the energy page. Retscreen uses these to adjust the energy produced by the wind farm to account for air density that differs from standard test conditions. The mass of air flowing through the rotor disc over a period of time changes with the density. Denser air leads to proportionally more power. Lower atmospheric pressure, such as at higher altitudes and warmer temperatures, decrease density. The influence of these parameters is shown at the bottom of the energy page. With the Other Information section open, we see the unadjusted annual electricity production per turbine. This is the production assuming standard air temperature and pressure. Below this, the pressure and temperature coefficients are given. The unadjusted production is multiplied by these coefficients. St. Lawrence is near sea level. On the location page, the elevation of the meteorological station is given at 49 meters. So our atmospheric pressure over the course of the year is very near the standard sea level value of 101.3 kilopascals. And the pressure coefficient is very near unity. That is, it causes only a minuscule decrease in the energy output. If the site had been at a higher elevation, however, the pressure coefficient could significantly reduce the energy production. When I speak of higher elevations, maybe you're imagining a turbine perched on a mountain. But many wind farms are far from mountains, yet still at elevations high enough to have an impact. For example, if our site had been near Calgary, Alberta, we'd be on the prairies, but at an elevation approximately 1,000 meters above sea level. Retscreen's climate database shows average atmospheric pressures around 89 kilopascals, and this would result in the energy production being adjusted downwards by around 12% due to the pressure. One subtle point here. Weather services typically report the atmospheric pressure corrected for elevation, that is, as though the site were at sea level. So, for example, if I visit the Environment Canada website for Calgary, I'll find an atmospheric pressure close to the sea level pressure of 101.3 kilopascals. If we use this pressure to estimate the air density, we'd overestimate the wind farm output by around 12%. Fortunately for us, Retscreen does not adjust the atmospheric pressure to sea level conditions. The second coefficient is for air temperature. 
the climate data suggests an annual average air temperature of 5.3 degrees Celsius. Wind turbine power output is specified for a standard temperature of 15 degrees Celsius. Since this site is, on average, 10 degrees colder than this, the air is denser, and according to the temperature coefficient, this raises the energy production by a factor of 1.035, or 3.5%. The combined effect of the pressure and temperature coefficients is reflected in the gross energy production per turbine. It is not much different from the unadjusted value. While the accuracy of the estimate of the site wind speed is critical, the energy production estimate will not be much affected by minor errors in the site temperature and pressure estimates. I'll use these annual average values for temperature and pressure for now, but you may be wondering whether it is reasonable to ignore the month-to-month -month variation in the atmospheric pressure and air temperature. We'll return to this question in part 3 of this video, when we look at a level 3 analysis. Turbine parameters are given in the next part of the energy page. The Virtual Energy Analyzer has used a generic 2 megawatt turbine. I'm going to go to the product database and select a Vestas V90 3 megawatt turbine on a 90 meter tower. I've chosen this turbine to illustrate a point about rotor and tower sizes that I'll make in part 4 of this video. I'm not making any endorsements here. The product database tells me that the turbine has a rotor 90 meters in diameter and describes the power curve. The power curve relates the turbine power output to the instantaneous wind speed. For example, for this particular turbine, if, at a point in time, the wind speed at the hub height is 9 meters per second, the turbine will put out 1,285 kilowatts of power. I'll use 27 of these turbines to build an 81 megawatt wind farm. It is not exactly 80 megawatts, but it is common in the industry to use round numbers to describe the power capacity of a project. Having made this selection, I'll click on the green checkmark icon to paste this power curve data into the analysis. On the energy page, the manufacturer, model, number of turbines, hub height, rotor diameter, swept area, and the power curve now reflect my selection from the product database. This is signified by the from database icon that appears at the right of the blue cells. The text in the gray cells is also from the database, but it doesn't affect the model calculations, so it is not important to know where it comes from. If I change a value, say, I change a point in the power curve, the from database icons will permanently disappear, at least until I paste data from the product database again. When looking at an analysis, this makes it easy to tell if any non-standard values have slipped in, giving a possibly misleading expectation of the wind farm performance. You'll see that to the right of the hub height cell, a wind speed of 9 meters per second is indicated. I can select this text to display the decimals and thus observe that it is 9.016 meters per second. This is Retscreen's estimate of the wind speed at the hub height. It has taken the value of 9.15 meters per second at a measurement height of 100 meters and adjusted it to a 90 meter height based on the power law and a wind shear exponent of 0.14. I mentioned that the power curve relates the instantaneous power output to the instantaneous wind speed. It is defined in the table and shown by the green line on the graphic in the energy page. The particular wind turbine I have chosen generates no power when the wind speed is below 4 meters per second, then it cuts in, with the power output ramping up markedly before leveling off at 15 meters per second. At wind speeds above this, the turbine adjusts the pitch, or angle, of the blades to maintain the rated power of 3 megawatts. Now we need to combine this power curve with the information about the wind resource that was previously entered in order to determine the turbine production over the course of a year. This is a bit complicated. We might be tempted, knowing that the average wind speed is 9 meters per second, to look at the value of the power curve at this wind speed and assume that the turbine puts out 1285 kilowatts on average year-round. This does not work because it ignores that the wind is not 9 meters per second all the time. Sometimes it is stronger, and sometimes it is weaker. 
Since the power curve does not take the form of a straight line, the average power output is not the value of the power curve at the average wind speed. You can check this by considering the artificial case where half the year the wind blew at exactly 3 meters per second and the other half of the year it blew at exactly 15 meters per second. The average wind speed is still 9 meters per second, but the average output would be the average of 0 and 3000 kilowatts or 1500 kilowatts. This is not the same as 1285 kilowatts, the value of the power curve at 9 meters per second. Thus, we need one more piece of information, and that is the distribution of wind speeds around the average. In the wind industry, it has been observed that the frequency distribution of wind speeds often approximates a mathematical function called the Weibull probability distribution. It has a value of zero for negative wind speeds, indicating that they never occur, rises towards a single peak at the most commonly recorded wind speed, and then tapers off in a long tail at high wind speeds, indicating that they do occur, but only during the rare storm. If you research the Weibull distribution, you'll see that it is a family of curves, the shape of which is determined by a so-called shape factor. At the pre-feasibility stage, you probably won't have the recorded data needed to determine the wind speed distribution at a proposed site. In that case, you can tell RETScreen to apply a typical distribution by selecting standard in the energy curve data cell. This assigns the shape factor a value of 2. This is what has been used by the virtual energy analyzer. If you do have information about the distribution of wind speeds at your site, either through measuring the wind speeds every, say, 10 minutes over a long period of time, or through a mathematical model of the site wind regime, you can specify the shape factor so that it matches your data by selecting Custom for energy curve data. I'll use the standard value since I don't know the distribution. Once we've specified the distribution, RETScreen can calculate the unadjusted power production of a turbine at our site. For each wind speed on the power curve, it examines the distribution to determine how many hours a year the wind turbine will experience that wind speed. It multiplies the number of hours by the power output at that wind speed, yielding the annual energy generation occurring at that wind speed. When it has done this for all wind speeds on the power curve, it sums the energy generation at each wind speed to get the total generation for the year. Scrolling to the bottom of the page, we can see that the result of this is, for a single Vestas V90 turbine, 11,723 megawatt hours per year when the hub height average wind speed is 9 meters per second. RETScreen does this calculation not just for the hub height wind speed, but for a range of annual average wind speeds from 3 meters per second to 15 meters per second. The locus of these values forms the energy curve displayed in tabular form beside the power curve and as the blue line in the graphic. It is provided for informational purposes. Note while both the power curve and the energy curve are functions of the wind speed, in the former it is the instantaneous wind speed and instantaneous power, and in the latter it is the annual average wind speed and annual energy production. Therefore, while it is not correct to use the annual average wind speed with the power curve, I can take the 9 meters per second average hub height wind speed and, looking at the energy curve, estimate that the unadjusted turbine output will be 11,696 megawatt hours per year. This differs from the 11,723 megawatt hour figure at the bottom of the page only because the hub height wind speed is not exactly 9 meters per second. This is the unadjusted turbine output, that is, the production if standard test conditions for both the atmosphere and the state of the turbine pertain throughout the year. We've already seen how RETScreen corrects for deviations in pressure and temperature from the standard test conditions, but real-world conditions can deviate from test conditions in other ways too. This is taken into account in the losses section. Array losses occur when there is more than one turbine in the wind farm. 
the wake of one turbine can reduce the output of other nearby turbines. The Virtual Energy Analyzer has suggested a value of 4% for this. If the turbines were especially close together, I might increase this. Airfoil losses describe how the output of the turbine is affected by dirt, insects, or ice accumulating on the blades and making them less aerodynamically efficient. Eastern Newfoundland experiences glaze icing events most winters, so I'm going to raise this slightly to 3%. Miscellaneous losses reflect other loss mechanisms. These include power that must be curtailed because there is no need for it, losses in transmission lines or transformers, off-specification turbine operation, and parasitic power consumption by the turbines themselves. If I look at Rett's Green Help, I see that this is near the high end of the range, so I'll reduce this to 5%. Finally, the availability refers to the percentage of the year that the turbines would be able to feed power to the grid, wind conditions permitting. Usually this is not 100% due to scheduled downtime, repairs, utility outages, and other causes of downtime. Having refined the inputs to the energy model, I now find a capacity factor of 40%, very close to the value proposed by the Virtual Energy Analyzer and used in the previous part of this video. In the next part of this video, I'll take a closer look at specifying wind farm costs.